This is Sunday Skate with Scott McLaughlin, Andrew Razor Raycroft, and Bridget Prue on WEEI. Kevin Shattenkirk in round five. Scores! Connor McMichael must score. And Swimming comes up with a gear. The Bruins kill a four-minute penalty in overtime and win by Jeremy Swayman's genius in a shootout. Welcome into Sunday Skate. Happy Easter to everyone celebrating. I'm Scott McLaughlin with Andrew Razor Raycroft and Bridget Peru. You just heard the highlights of the Bruins 3-2 shootout win over the Capitals on Saturday. As Jack mentioned, they kill a four-minute double minor in overtime, which was impressive. Brandon Carlo was out there for three of the four minutes. Andrew Peake, just about the same. Charlie Coyle was on for half of it as the forward. Uh, Swayman had four saves on that penalty kill and then three more in the shootout. So it ends up being a, I think a really good win. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of, a lot of these Sunday skates where I've come on here and been kind of the negative one, but yes. I'm excited about this. Yeah. I'm I out of the gates. Listen, like they're a better team than Washington. They probably should have won that in regulation, but I like, I liked the way they played for the most part. They held the capitals to 16 shots on goal in regulation. Fewest the Bruins have allowed all season. So, sure, maybe they could have done more offensively. We can get into that and how different lines looked because Montgomery switched up all kinds of combinations for this game. Uh, But I think you have to come away from that feeling pretty good. That that would have been been a real letdown had they given up a goal in that overtime. You would have felt like, man, that's that's a game they probably should have won. They did a great that the 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 PK was awesome that that makes the game. I think if they they lose another one and like I, I it's almost at the point where it's like well you might as well just go get the loss record in overtime at this point <laughs> like they're so close to it and, and it doesn't affect me one way or the other. See um, they do have a record to chase. Ex- yeah exactly like you, that I was kind of thinking that last at least, especially when they got the high stake I'm like all right well you know all right go for twenty you know you might as well get twenty at this point. Um, <laughs> But I, it, it was just a good good character. It adds into the week, right? It ties into the week, I think, as well. It was a, kind of a good finish. They deserve to get four points out of that week. Um, you mentioned the way they played Saturday. I thought they played great on Tuesday, especially defensively. Their structure, 21 shots against Florida. Florida's got a little bit of an offensive issue right now against everybody, but... Um, and then even Wednesday, I, I didn't think that they were um, taking any shifts off defensively, even in Tampa. So so it's a huge week defensively, huge week for their structure. And, and to get four points out of the week, I think it's really positive for them. Yeah, I mean, we were talking about trying to ramp up to playoff hockey. And and with the week before this, Razor, I think it was, it was, it was Monday, right, where they had that practice where they – Montgomery ran them because he didn't like their effort and he said they weren't and in playoff mode they weren't playing at the at the rate they needed to be but then you see them come back and you see them play that Florida game that looked like playoff hockey there was more intensity to that um and you see them playing these desperate teams like Washington and coming out on top now it would have been a, a different story if they give up a goal late in regulation or if they give up a goal on that four minute power play um which Luckily for Lindholm, they didn't because I thought other other than like that would have been people would look at that as maybe his fault for taking the high stick and t- taking that penalty in overtime. But um glad it didn't really put a black mark on his game because I thought he played well. He made the save right in the beginning of the game and then he and then he had the goal in the first as well. And, and I, I don't know. I thought he's been playing better. And we can talk about the different D pairs because today he wasn't or yesterday he wasn't with Brendan Carlo. He, he was playing with Charlie McAvoy. Yeah, I thought it was a really strong game for Hampus Lindholm. And you're right, had he been sitting in the box when they scored the winner, that would unfortunately wash a lot of it away. Um, yeah, that great play to save a goal in the first period. And quite frankly, 
bail out his partner on that because Charlie McAvoy had a tough turnover in the offensive zone that led to that chance. Uh, and then his goal, you know, just throwing it on net, good things happen. Like, boy, yeah. well, it wasn't, wasn't a snipe, wasn't anything fancy. Um, Brad Marchand actually had to duck out of the way. Uh, but, yeah, even aside from that, like, I thought he had a really strong game. Um, I was going to ask Razor. Uh, so I heard Swayman after the game say he he owes Lindholm a, a Swedish fika, which yeah. means coffee. Uh, <laughs> just and they and they love their fika. Um, how how many times did you have to buy anyone dinner or or uh, you know anything yeah. for for bailing you out? No, you say you are, but you <laughs> never actually <laughs> spend money on Hal Gill. Well, There's coffee. no way I would spend money on those guys. Um, <laughs> After all the times I bailed them out, they <laughs> so. But you definitely say it. Uh, no, there's sometimes uh, you. It, it's a big, you know, like it is fun when that happens. It, it, it does. Guys get excited about it when when a player makes a save. Michael Ryder, you know, like that. As a goalie, you get a big kick out of it out on the ice. So Jeremy was probably fired up. Does a goalie have to buy like his defenseman any gifts at any? Because we always hear in like in, the f- linemen. Yeah, in football, we always yeah. hear about a quarterback having to buy offensive linemen like Christmas gifts or whatever. Not. Um, I mean, I, 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 I didn't make ten million dollars. Maybe the ten million dollar goalies, Vasilevsky, probably should be buying his defenseman something. Um, I, I wasn't. Uh, I wasn't giving away any of my money um, <laughs> to any of those guys. You know, maybe, maybe, but no, it's funny. It's just it's it's less of a it's less um, group based I guess in an NHL room just you know just that many less people where everyone's kind of more together I don't re- I don't even really remember having a dinner where it was just goalies and defensemen um, which is a good question I, I don't remember that ever happening like oh we're gonna get all together even the D doing it get like the forwards be like you guys are losers like you know, <laughs> what are you doing we're a team that kind of stuff so no it's um, that's fine. I haven't thought about that, but no, I don't remember doing that. And I don't remember ever just even having a, 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 a goalie dinner, not even just a goalie dinner. Well, Swayman said after he said, I'm going to go give them all hugs when I finish this interview. So there you go. Maybe just hugs, right? Yeah. Did you do that? No, Free no. The Jeremy's a hugger. I, <laughs> yeah. We didn't do hugs. No, there was no <laughs> hugging. So uh, we mentioned Lindholm was up playing with McAvoy. That was one of many lineup changes. The other was loading up. The top line, putting Pasenak and Marshan back together with Zaka centering them, and they were on the ice for that Lindholm goal. Uh, all three involved. Pasenak had the zone entry, pull up to keep possession. Zaka makes the pass over to Lindholm. Marshan's at the net front. Thought it was a good game for that line. Uh, then after that, so you put you put Coyle with Heinen and Frederick. DeBrusque is down on the third line with Geeky and Brazo. Brazo gets a look there. I think that's interesting to note because it feels like there is very much a job on that third lineup for grabs. Uh, you know, probably had been penciled in as James Van Reems Dykes, but he has been battling illness, hasn't looked great when he's been in recently, has been in and out of the lineup. So it seems like that's what's really up for grabs. Interesting to see Brizzo get a look there. It was the second game in a row that Lindholm and Carlo weren't together. Uh, Montgomery had also split them up for the Tampa game. And I'm curious, Razor, if you think, is this the right time to be experimenting? Or should this be the time where you're trying to like really lock in your lineup? Because there was a pretty long stretch before this where Montgomery had actually kept the lines together pretty consistently, which is rare enough for him anyways. And now eight, seven games left, we're getting, he's even called it experimenting. He wants to see who has chemistry with who. And I, I guess my opinion is like, you're probably not quite close enough for it to, you know, it's not a bad idea yet, but it, I'm a little surprised that like it, this didn't start five games ago that it's happening with under 10 games left. Well, the, the so so no, I I'm I'm not surprised based off of last season, based off how Montgomery's philosophy. I I should say, um, five games ago, six games ago is too long ago. Like we were talking, right? We were talking a couple weeks ago. Like there's still a month left in the season when when everyone was saying they play, they're playing. Like 
there's still a month left. It's too far away. You can't sustain experimenting for a whole month. Guys get tired of it. Guys get worn out. You're really not going to get a lot out of it because what's happening on March 13th is completely different than what's happening on April 13th. So I think he, after this week, I think on Monday with the, the yelling and the reset and everything else that happened, I think that put everyone in playoff mode. He decided on Monday or he decided Saturday afternoon after that Philly game that he was going to make playoff mode happen on Monday. It didn't matter how they started in practice. He was going to yell and scream and make them skate. It, like, that's all fairly premeditated from a coach. Like, he was mad Saturday, mad all day Sunday, sitting at home, hanging out with his family, woke up mad Monday morning, and just was going to let loose on them. That, there's There was no way that they could have avoided it. They could have looked like the 84 Oilers in practice, and they were going to get skated, and they were going to get put into playoff mode Monday. So... I think that's all part of his playoff mode is is getting the D interested in who's going to play and who's not going to play, get them focused on this is a competition for the next three weeks and give them an opportunity to fight their way back into the lineup in an, both forwards and defense. So I think that's what he did there. I think he has a two-week window, and you get uh, – Let's say next, the what, what do we got the ninth? Who's that? Carolina at home. I would say after that Carolina at home game, he's going to have a very good idea after playing Carolina, Florida, Tampa, what he wants to do with these lineups, depending on who they play in, in, in the playoffs. Now, just quickly, because I just took a lot on that, just going back to I love Carlo and Matt, or McAvoy and Lindholm stat line last night. That this, this, this defense time on ice, this is exactly what I want to see basically every playoff game. McAvoy, 27. Lindholm, 26. Carlo, 23. Peak, 21. And then you have Shaddy and Grizzlick at 13. That's essentially a winning defensive time on ice game come playoff time for me. And I wanted to see it last year and Orlov got in the mix and I think it just threw things off on the back end enough. That's not, an, you know, they should have all played better. But what I want, like, I want to see Car- McAvoy and Lindholm. That, that's what I, I want to see that pair. I want to see them out there a lot of the time. I want to see one of them out in the ice as much as we possibly can see them because I think that's really the strategy that works. And now I just pulled up Z's minutes, Zidane Char's minutes in like the 11 playoffs because I was like, how much did he actually play? And it wasn't 30 a night. Like, like it was, he played 30 a couple times, a couple overtime games. He got over 30, but a lot of it was 26, 25, 27, 28, 28, 28, 26, 28, 26. That's, that's essentially what a number one defense minute looked like come playoff time. And that's what McAvoy's going to have to eat for this team to win. And Lindholm's going to be right, have to be right behind him. It's, it's not a bad thing. And they can use those minutes, they can eat those minutes. But that's what it's going to have to look like for this team to win. Yeah, and they're starting to use Andrew Peak more, and he had his most time, his highest time on ice for the Bruins. Well, since he became a Bruin, he had just over 21 minutes, and a lot of that it felt like uh, a big chunk of that came on the penalty kill, especially late. And he did really well with with taking over that role. And you so you see Derek Forbert go out of the lineup for injury and and have to get surgery and and you know he's not going to come back. But you you do add someone at the trade deadline that didn't cost you a whole lot. That's coming in and playing that role that you needed. Is and it, he's he's not the guy that's going out of the lineup every day either. Like it's it's a it seems more of a battle between Shattenkirk, Lorai, Wotherspoon, and that Peak's kind of carving out a role for himself where he's valuable, so they're not gonna take him out. Is it too early to applaud Don and, and the crew for finding Peak? I don't think so. Uh it a little too early. Let's not take let's see how All he does right. in the playoffs. All right. I'm not, yeah, not taking You get a guy like that under three million dollars for the next two years in your lineup, that's like huge, huge cap value. To pull that out was impressive. I think we can say yes just because the risk was so low and you need your you have a position of need that well, Forbert vacated and you're able to find someone young with still some term left. He's not a rental. And hopefully he continues to do what he's been doing. Yeah, the, the risk was low in terms of the return, in terms of what you gave up. My concern at the time was the contract, was that you're committing to him for two more years after this, which you had to make sure you get his game right for him to be worth that contract. And so far, he looks pretty right here. He has minimal playoff experience, so I'm going to wait to see how he looks in the playoffs because 
we saw last year, you know, not that it's the only reason the Bruins lost, far from it, but you saw a third pairing that struggled with Forbert and Clifton, guys who had been good in the regular season, you know, looked like they had their roles carved out, run into Florida, and all of a sudden they struggle, and your third pairing becomes a problem. So I want to see Peak do it in the playoffs. You know, that can't be a weakness. But, yeah, another good game for him on Saturday for sure. And, yeah, four of his minutes came on the penalty kill. Two of them, or like two and a half, just in overtime alone. Um, so, yeah, that's very valuable. I, Razor, I, like, you're right about Lindholm and McAvoy, and I think it was important to, I was surprised the first game that Montgomery split Lind, Lindholm and Carlo up that he didn't immediately go to Lindholm McAvoy as a pairing. He went Lindholm peak, and Carlo was with Wotherspoon for that game uh, down in Tampa because, We've we've seen Lindholm and McAvoy together at times this year, but it's almost always in like an offensive situation, you know, offensive zone draw. They're gonna load those two up, or when they're trying to come back. Occasionally you see them together trying to hold on to a lead too. But it was always kind of like specialty situations. I like the idea of giving them a whole game together, running through five on five shifts, all situations, all zones. Um, and yeah, that their numbers were even beyond the minutes, like the, the Corsi, the shot attempts when they were on the ice, all good. Um, I mentioned McAvoy had the one boo-boo that led to that chance that, that Lindholm had to save off the goal line. But other than that, they, they look good. And I think it's important to get them a little bit of time together because you are probably going to run with them together for longer stretches, because as you mentioned, they're going to be the two sucking up the most minutes. So you're they're they're just naturally going to end up with shifts together because yeah. Carlo's not going to play as many minutes as Lindholm is. Grizzlick's not going to play as many minutes as McAvoy is. So, yeah, getting them together is def- the, definitely something I think that they had to do before with, the playoffs. With, with the defense, and, and I heard a couple of the guys talk about it this week when, when they were asked questions about it, there there isn't – they don't – they don't think that they need to play with each other very much to feel comfortable because like you said they they overlap so much throughout a season they they play with each other and are so much closer in communicating and talking on the bench as a defense group or as those four defense sitting on the bench while there's two on the ice so often that 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 chemistry that those guys have isn't that important um, and, and is it, you don't have to play five games together at the end of the season to know exactly where they're going. They, they can do it very quickly. They feel very comfortable as a group playing together. Um, you move them around a little bit. I think you're doing it a little bit as well just to get everyone's attention when you put their numbers up on the board. Again, that's a coaching tactic. Um, but, but do believe them when they say, we don't really need to play together a lot. Like we all feel comfortable playing with each other and being out there on the ice together. It does help for a game here or there to to get a full 60, like you said, with Lindholm and McAvoy, especially they're used to having the puck. So how do they play off each other? But but they, they don't need 15. Like Lindholm and McAvoy are way too good to need 10 games together here to be good together in game one. So they can ping pong a little bit more. It's it's more the usually the forward unit with that extra forward in the mix, that extra player, that extra communication, that extra person. Those are the guys that that want a little bit more time together. Yeah, my thought is is that it was more to see what the rest of the like what the rest of the D look like when those two like when you're separating Lindholm and Carlo. Like, how does Grizzly look there? How does my how does my third pair look? Like, just to see how it all falls in line when you just to. To get a, a look at it, basically. Right, yeah. Grizzly and Carlo hadn't been together yeah. in a while. And I thought, I thought you know, Carlo looked freed up a bit, too. He had six shot attempts in that game. Uh, so we're often running here on Sunday Skate. We can get more into the defense. Definitely want to get more into Montgomery's call out and the timing of that and the week that followed. You can join in, 617-779-7937. Text us at 37937. A lot of shots, but I thought I had playoff pace. Yes, I thought both teams uh, were very um, responsible, like getting above pucks. Or, that's why it wasn't a lot of shots. There just wasn't a lot of plays to make because people were above you, and it was pretty physical out there. 
Welcome back to Sunday Skate with Andrew Raycroft and Bridget Prue. I'm Scott McLaughlin. That's Jim Montgomery after the Bruins 3-2 shootout win over the Capitals. On Saturday, talking about it just being a tight-checking game, there not being many offensive chances. Mentioned in the first segment, the Bruins only gave up 16 shots in regulation. Uh, Conversely, they only had 26 themselves, so not like they were, you know, racking up great scoring chances. I am so I feel like if we look at this week as a whole, a lot of tight checking games for sure. The Florida Panthers game was the one that actually felt like a playoff game that, you know, really had the emotion and physicality. Tampa felt like a you know, Bruins were on the bat on a back to back. It looked like that, especially in the third period. They're trying to come back in that game, then go seven minutes without a shot on goal. Uh, to finish it off, just like they, they didn't have their legs. Tampa, I thought, was kind of sloppy, too. That was their first game after a long West Coast road trip. And the Washington game, I, I don't know if you guys think that like, that felt like a playoff game because it really didn't to me. Like, the, the Capitals are fighting for their playoff lives, and, and I give the Bruins credit for keeping them in check. But I, they didn't – it didn't look like they were playing super desperate hockey. And – I didn't think the Bruins really were either. It felt like a game where the Bruins were better than the Capitals and were kind of doing just enough. And they end up with the two points in the end, which is probably what they deserved. But I kind of feel like the Capitals, the way they showed up, like they they were there for – that could have been a dominant win for the Bruins. And they didn't quite bring it to that that next level. You know, I, I don't think you have to every single game, but it did feel like there was there was more there for them in that game that they kind of left on the table but still ended up getting the two points in the end. Well, in, in Washington, you can't, bring, you can't bring it. You can't play desperation every single night for, like, two months. It's exhausting. Yeah. You, know, you're, 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 you can't. It's, it's impossible. They got smoked by Toronto two days ago, so they traveled late. They get in late. They're, like, they're grinding – and you're playing desperate, but you're also exhausted and physically and mentally you get drained. And that's what Washington's done all year. They, they've been very okay, obviously, with their goal differential, but they find ways to get points. They find ways to get it to overtime. They find, like, and and certainly they're going to be the most, the much more disappointed not getting two points after having a four minute four on three. Um, so, no, it, it, listen, they're still. You're not going to get – you're going to get playoff intensity once a week, right? That's all you can ask of these guys right now. You, the 82 games, 75 games into the season, you get it Tuesday night, you know you're not getting it Wednesday night out of this group. There, there was no chance that they were going to have the same jam, the same luster uh, for that game Wednesday night. It was impossible. And then Saturday, you're still on the road. You've been in a hotel for two days. Like, you're just kind of trying to survive that one as well. So – uh, what do we got? We got Tuesday night at home on in Nashville. So you could probably expect uh, a slow first period. I would say they're going to get out shot in the first period. Nashville is going to come hard. Then they're going to find a way to hang around. It'll be a close game. And then Thursday in Carolina will be a good game. The, you're going to get a lot out of that Thursday game. That'll probably be the playoff game this week. So I, that's yeah, kind of how I look at it. Then they play the Panthers again at the end of the week on Saturday. Yeah, and that'll be uh, – that's an afternoon game. That's a 3.30. Yeah, so that'll be a pillow fight. <laughs> <laughs> pillow fight where, I, well, it was a heavyweight fight this week. It was. 3.30, it'll be, you know, Florida. It's, you know, it'll be it'll be one of those – Florida's got to win that game. That is the one thing with that. Florida can't lose all four to – yeah. Uh, the the horrible the the Bruins team that doesn't you know has a hard time against good teams can't win is seven and zero against the Leafs and the uh, Florida Panthers folks. Just saying. Seven I think and it's the, you hear just it's the fear talking. <laughs> You're talking about oh, don't want to yeah, match up against Florida. Yeah, I don't want to match up those guys. They're well, seven and zero. And they they were in that the game was Tuesday, right? Uh, Kachuk was was doing what he does. Bennett was was getting involved. Like that team just has agitators that um luckily for the Bruins they found a way to to use it as their own motivation and and raise their level of energy and emotion up to that level that Florida kind of drew them to a higher level in that game it kind of felt like yeah and I I think 
I think this Bruins team sometimes needs that. Like, they sometimes need to be drawn in. I don't know that – I don't know that, like, it's in their DNA to consistently be the team that starts the agitation and the physicality and all that. But it's encouraging to see when they go up against a team like the Panthers that they can bring it, they can match it. And I know I, – I don't know how much of this you guys – caught if if it's none then great job by you avoiding sports radio but um somehow there was like this narrative this week that it was actually a bad thing that like the Bruins respond like it showed that they're not that like they don't want to do that or something and I I could not disagree more like I you have to respond when you're playing the Panthers and if you respond the right way then it's absolutely a good thing and the Bruins responded the right way I don't think they crossed any lines I know they got the extra penalty once or twice but I I didn't think it was like Wotherspoon I don't think he deserved an extra two if anything Kachuk should have been you know he kicked a skate out at him and like got away with it like I I don't know what you want Wotherspoon to do there but Kachuk's really good they're really good at not getting caught with the first move it's unbelievable they're really ratty and good but I I get my guess would be the narrative would be negative had they not responded as well my guess was like like Jim Montgomery deciding that Monday was going to be a hard skate day and I'm going to yell at everybody my guess is starting tomorrow morning for five days um, these microphones will be fairly negative about something that the Bruins have done this weekend too. So uh, that's kind of standard. Um, Are you looking at Scott? No, I'm not. No, I'm <laughs> no. looking. I'm 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 looking, looking at the, the not not me this I'm, week. The, the weekday the, programming. No, he's Mr. Positive this morning. Not at all. I'm talking about the uh, maybe the daily shows that somehow only work on negativity. <laughs> that you do have to call into occasionally. <laughs> yes, and- I, yeah, that's right. And some and 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 be Mr. Positive or Mr. Reality, uh, that, that everything's okay when you have 101 points in 75 games. Again, again. And the good thing is, too, right, they're not winning the President's Trophy now. Now they're just a great team, like second or third in the league. That's like the perfect sweet spot for this group that you can still now win the division. And, yes, folks, they're – I would – you feel like they're still in the driver's seat to do that. I, I The game in hand, I, I haven't looked at Florida's schedule all the way through. I'm assuming it's a back-to-back somewhere. Like, games in hand at this time of year, I think we're seeing, aren't a good thing. They're, they're, they're a good thing in December. In, in You can kind of say, oh, we're going to get those games back at some point. But this time of year, you don't want to be Washington or Toronto with nine games left compared to a team with seven because you don't get the rest. And you can dollars to donuts. You've got two back to backs on a Saturday afternoon that that are just hard to win. So well, they they have a back to back coming up Monday, Tuesday. Florida. Yes. Yes. So um, there you Toronto go. and Montreal, but their schedule is pretty soft. Besides, they have two games against Toronto. They have the game against the Bruins. Other than that, these are all non playoff teams. Oh uh, yeah, I'm just saying. I'm not worried about who they're playing or what they're playing. I'm just saying the timing of their games. I'm just saying yeah. that you know the, those you know the extra game, the fact that you have seven games in two weeks. The the, the playoffs aren't starting until April 20th, so they have 21 days to play seven games. It's crazy light schedule. Very good for a team going into the playoffs, and different than playing nine and 20. Yeah, and I think I think that's you also get more practice time exactly. leading into the playoffs. It's just, like it's. The preparation so much better. Yeah, whereas you look at last year, they had a pretty crowded schedule down yep. the stretch, and and I think that definitely did hurt them. Like, I, I know at the time, you know, no matter what's going on, players and coaches will try to spin it as a positive because – you don't, you don't want to give your team any excuses leading up to the playoffs. Yeah, well, it is but, what it is, right? It's like yeah. kind of like you, no one's really you can't ready do anything to about have, it. Yeah. be ready to be a parent, but you have a baby and you have to take care of it. Like that's <laughs> like the same idea with these playoffs. Like when coaches have these teams, it's like this is what we have, so this is how we're going to do it. But but at the end of the day, if you really get them on lie detector tests, to your point, they're going to say I'd rather play seven games than ten games in the next ten days. Yeah, and and – you also have that little, like, almost a week break between end of the regular season and the first game of the playoffs. So, you know, like, you're going to have to have good practices in there. It's just a, a lot of time, a lot of prep time, which should be a good thing. It's certainly better than just having games all all crammed together. Yeah. Uh, let's take Maria and Watertown here, who has some 
some thoughts on, on an area we haven't touched on yet, and that's the Bruins power play. Good morning, Maria. Yes, but for, good morning, everyone. Happy Easter and, um, ha- you know, happy however you all uh, choose to celebrate it. Thank you. Just um, quick, quickly on the negativity, here's what I do, right? I close out the Odyssey app and move <laughs> on to award-winning podcasts such as <laughs> Um, the Skate Pod and Morning Brew, because I just can't listen to the made-up nonsense. I need reality when we're talking about this team. Um, quickly on the on the power play, you know what? Unit One has still has a, is having its struggles. They they were moving it a little bit less deliberately in the game um, last night, but I'm I'm having a very difficult un- time understanding with all the talent that is out on the ice on that first power play unit why it seems to me that the second power play unit is moving it around much more quickly, creating a little bit more confusion and chaos. And how long of a leash does the coaching staff provide to that unit one to, to find, find its way um, on the power play? Because, you know, at some point it does need to work a little bit. I'm not saying it needs to work all the time, but it does need to work a little bit. So um, those are my questions today. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks, Maria. Uh, on on the power on that top power play unit, I feel like they're starting to move a little bit more, and I, I think maybe Marshan going net front forces some of that because he's not he's not going to be stationary at the net front. So if he's moving, it kind of forces everyone else to move. But what you saw on Saturday was a lot of movement around the outside, like guys switching positions, moving to different wings, rotating, cycling, but then the puck just stayed on the outside. And it's like the next, all right, that's a good first step. The next step has to be just get it to the net and look for ugly plays. Just look for banging in rebounds, tips, whatever, get it off of skating in. It seems like they're still looking for that perfect seam pass. And, good penalty kills just aren't going to give you that. Like you got to be way more willing than they've been to just get it to the net and, and bang away. And I think that's what that second unit's doing. Like you see, yeah. you see Justin Brazo and Trent Frederick just banging away at the net front. Very right at the top simple. Of the crease. Yeah. Very simple. Throw, throw the pucks on goal. Hope for, hope for a rebound. Oh, if it doesn't go in, hope for a rebound, just put it right back on goal. It's, it's very simple what they're doing and, and it's working for them. Yeah. They're, they're struggling. They're struggling and and they're though they're working through it. I, I think we're seeing that small, small incremental improvement. They're at least getting in the zone yesterday, uh, better in the zone two Wednesday than they did Tuesday. Um, you hope they're saving it uh, again. They flipped it last year because they went through a bad power play stretch the last season. Even though they were scoring a million goals, um, they've done it a couple times over the last three or four or five years. Fortunately, the playoffs uh, penalties are less, but are more important. Like you need you need David to score power play goals, and I think at the end of the day, unfortunately, it is kind of an individual thing. You want to talk about the unit working and everything, but it's the reality is they Marshawn has scored one goal in twenty games. I mean that that's that's where it kind of starts and ends. David Pasternak hasn't scored a power play goal forever, and that's kind of what. So you you start looking. I'm I'm looking at that top unit and I'm looking at the individuals. Like at some point, you guys just have to figure it out. Um, and, and that's I'm sure where the coaches are getting at. You can only, we, guys, we can show you video over and over again. But the reality, you just have to be better. You have to outwork the penalty killers, and we have to figure it out. Do you think that James Van Riemsdyk not being there has a, is part of the the negative effect, like of why they haven't been doing as well? Because I mean that he. I mean, the role that he plays is a very simple role. Um, and I know when you have a guy out in front of the net that can take away the goalie's vision and when you have a guy out in front of the net that can grab a rebound and put it in, it, it does kind of simplify your, your game plan. Just get a shot through, and it could either redirect off him or the goalie couldn't see it. It, it I think, to me, it, there's some correlation to not having the best net front guys out there on the top unit uh, and them not scoring as much on the power play. Uh, I hope not. I hope the the this unit isn't depending on James Van Riemsdyk. 
I mean, not I, like, necessarily you know what I mean? like I don't as, think not him as a player, but like the role that he plays. Yeah, no, like, no, the I, importance yeah, no, of, it's a, and it and and it, and he's good at it, and he was good at it. I think it is a, an element that they could use off and on at different times. I, I think. And and maybe in a small sample size, that's the case. I think in the big picture, these guys should be able to score with me in front of the net, right? Like th- that's that's kind of where it. it this is what you get paid to do: put me in, put 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 me in front of the net, put Maddie Faulkner in front of the net, oh, and the other, the other back in the day, <laughs> the other four guys should be able to move it around and score goals. Like that. That's kind of um, so I. I because they've had Coyle, they've had Zaka, they've had DeBrus, they've had a bunch of other pieces there, and that's and Geeky worked for a little while. So, um, I I'm not I'm not I'm not diminishing that you would like to have a net front guy that can tip the puck, but these guys don't really want to keep it simple. It's very obvious they don't want to just put it to the point and wrist it. That's not what David Pasternak does. That's not what Brad Marchand does. So I don't think if you did have Van like. I don't think Van Riemsdyk was there for them to take wristers in front. That that's I guess what I'm saying. Like they're they he was kind of there and he worked it a little bit, but they were still trying to to find seam passes even when he was out there. Yeah, and that's why where I think move. I don't know if it lasts, but moving Marsh in there at least for a little while, I think is a good idea just because it forces Marsh in to get to that area more mm-hmm. rather than holding onto the puck in that right circle, looking, looking, looking. You know, and then all of a sudden he forces something, nothing really happens. Like, if you're going to be around the net, everything's going to have to happen faster. You're going to have to be more aggressive. Yep. So I think that it should, in theory, at least help get him into that mindset. And they also, like, they did it really quickly on against Florida on Tuesday night where David was up top and McAvoy was over on the floor. Like, I wouldn't mind seeing more of that, too. Maybe that's how David, you know, that's the simplification of – uh, getting pucks to the net, but at least it's Pasta who can actually beat a goalie from up top with a one-timer there rather than a wrister from McAvoy. So maybe that's that's the answer to simplifying too, um, is moving him around and Pat, Marshy. Marshy needs to, Marshy needs to score. It, it, like yeah. I've said it three weeks in he's a row been, now. He's been stuck on 399 yeah. for a oh long time. God, now. it's killing. It has to be killing him. It I has heard- to be. It's in his head. He's missed open nets now. He can't, like, the empty net, six on five. Yet. Like, it's like, that was automatic. Remember <laughs> remember those days when, like, Brad Marchand, six on five? Oh, automatic goal, automatic goal, automatic goal. He's scored 50 of them over two years, six on five. And now it's it's such a slog and a struggle. I, like, he needs a goal so badly. And I, I really do think that that will free a lot up when he gets it. I really do. Well, I heard Jack try to... Give him credit for that Lindholm goal. He's like, I think he might have got a piece yeah, of it. Yeah, everyone's dying for <laughs> it's it. It's like, oh, that might be 400. It's that like, no, nah, he didn't been, touch it. <laughs> that been, that's what he needs. He needs one to go off his head. <laughs> yeah, that's, like, that's how that one would have gone in if, yeah. if it had got a piece yeah, of him. Exactly. It grazed off his helmet. Yeah. Uh, you know, I also think McAvoy has been a little bit more shoot first recently, which also is something that needs to happen in that unit. Mm-hmm. He hits a crossbar in the power play Saturday. If that shot's two inches lower, we're talking about, hey, great to see the first power play unit get one. Great to see McAvoy shooting. So, Look at how simple they are. Yeah, right. <laughs> All right, so we, we got to catch a break here. But more Sunday Skate after this. Call in 617-779-7937. We'll be right back. Oh, they have a ton of ton of weapons on their power play. They've, they've been known for that for years, and uh, it's just a credit to to their players and their coaches understanding that you know they have threats all over the ice, so you have to respect the shot. That's why guys are getting shot lanes and you know different guys open up and obviously Ovi being one of those guys is is one that we all keep an eye on but again you know, see Mac makes a big block in regulation uh, Brando countless blocks you know, every night and and that's something special for our team moving forward so this win definitely goes to my decor block and shot welcome back to Sunday skate that was Jeremy Swayman talking about the work of his defense against the Capitals and specifically Alex Ovechkin who has come on a little bit in the second half of the season and been part of this Washington playoff push for a team that looked dead in the water uh, earlier this season, actually sold at the trade deadline, and now has gone on this run. And doesn't just look like they're going to be in the playoffs. It looks like they're going to be the three the three seed in the uh, Metropolitan yeah, Division. And they they only needed the one point to move into to third in the Metro. Yeah, so they, and the, they and the, the, fly, the Flyers are giving away that spot. Yeah, they there. are. 
they're, technically they're tied. They both have 82 points, but right now with, with the head to head, Washington's in, not even in the wild card anymore when they actively made their roster worse at the trade deadline. And they've been playing without Tom Wilson. Yeah, he, he's been suspended. Shocker. Yeah, I know. I, people, yeah, he's got to be know. back soon now. It's got to be. What, yeah, it might, he has one it more might game. Four, five yeah. games. He's got one game left. Yeah, yeah. so. Um, yeah, Washington, they've they've done a great job. Lindgren's been awesome in gold. And, and we saw it yesterday. Like, they're minus 31 goal differential, and they're going to get into the playoffs. That that's gonna that has to have set a record or will set a record. That That is bananas to be – to or, have yeah. that few – they've got 201 goals. At, at least the most in, like, a long time. Like, if you go back to the days where – Well, everybody like, got like in. Like, 16 out of 24 yeah, made yeah, it. Yeah, it doesn't count. You know, you, you'd get – You'd get some teams that were probably minus a hundred, but um, yeah, certainly in the modern era, like they, they goal differential wise, they're gonna have to be one of the worst. And that roster, like you look up and down that roster, and you're just like, who are these guys? It's like, <laughs> like yeah, how- and it, it's I I talked to I did this somewhere else, um, and a, it, it's very very um, similar to the Bruins in that. Their minor league team is good. They won a championship last season. All of these players that no one's heard of that were made that were laughing about, right? All won trophies last year. They all figured out how to go on long playoff runs. You don't have to know who Justin Brazo is. He doesn't have to be this fancy hockey news five star prospect to be this important player for your organization. And this is what Washington's done, and it's. Vi- very similar to what happens here. Oh, the Bruins have no prospects. The Bruins have no draft picks. The Bruins have no, no – but all these guys go down to the minors and they learn how to play over two years. The Beechers, the Brazos, they Parker understand – Wotherspoon, they understand – Boquist going down to start Boquist the season. going down. Yeah. They, they, under, they go there and they learn and they get better and they develop and then they come up and they're like, oh, they're NHLers. That's what Washington's done. Hershey's the best team. Providence is second in their conference in the AHL right now. Hershey's running away with it, and they're just continuing to build these players that learn how to win, that learn what a pro game is, and and now that they have a coach that's able to to harness that and and make it better, that's that's what their model is. So I um, wonder if they would change what they did at the deadline, like in hindsight. I don't think I no it could be I don't well, no, I don't think so because I think you get rid of – I think they're going to be able to build in the summer now differently, and I would expect them to go get and spend money. Uh, that Kuznetsov you know, salary is, is a big one that they get to spend money on and, and help these guys out. I think um, from, from 5,000 miles away, the two guys they got rid of don't – have never been uh, accused of being great teammates or great – Culture yeah. guys, yeah. Uh, Amantha and a Kuznetsov. So I think it's probably more along those yeah, lines yeah. and why you got rid of them. And Mantha was another big contract, too. That Yeah. He, 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 he got a, traded as soon as Eiserman showed up in Detroit. He got rid, he couldn't get rid of that kid fast enough. And, and the Capitals capitalizing on a season where he has the best shooting percentage of his career. Yeah. You know, pucks are just jumping in the net for him. Like, no, absolutely a smart trade. And, and realistically, they're not. I know anything can happen, but like. They're not a team that's seriously making a cup yes. run. Yep. So if they can retool and, and set themselves up better for the future and then still make a run this year, like that, you know. I, that's I, the I, best of both yeah, worlds Yeah, I think they them. took the smart path. Yep. Yeah, I, I have a hard time seeing them where they're matched up right now beating Carolina. <laughs> Carolina has 19 more points than them in the standings. Carolina is a better team. Uh, if it's a Carolina Washington first round series, I think you can you can go. Yeah, I don't think that they needed to be buyers at the deadline, um, because I think that would be a that'd be a matchup that favors Carolina pretty heavily. I don't see them being able to upset, you know, Boston, New York, Carolina, whoever they were to draw. Yeah, it, it feels like the way things are setting up right now. You look at the standings; all the Atlantic teams would stay together. It, you know, it'd be. As of right now, it would be Boston versus Tampa, Florida, Toronto. And then all the Metro teams stay together. You'd get New York, Philly, Carolina, Washington. Feels like that sh- those should be, like, pushovers for the Rangers and Hurricanes. Like, yeah, can't really see Washington or Philly giving those teams much of a series. But then those two, that'll be quite, that'd be quite the battle in the second round. Uh, we got to 
we got to hit our last break here of the hour. Hour two of Sunday Skate coming up. Join in. We got a couple calls we got to get to. See you, Joe, Jay. Some texts we want to respond to. Uh, so we'll be back right after this. This is Sunday Skate with Scott McLaughlin, Andrew Razor Raycroft, and Bridget Prue on WEI. What does it say about this group to be able to win so many different ways and be able to respond when things don't go your way? It means a lot, especially this time of year. Um, you know, I think we had our moments there where, you know, we we were losing a lot of these games a couple months ago, going into uh, overtimes and either losing there or losing in shootouts. So I think, uh, you know, it just it's great to see us turning a corner and, and obviously taking strides there. Welcome back. Hour two of Sunday Skate. Coming back with what I believe Nico told us was his alarm clock song at one point. And, and his roommates That's correct. were happy about that. <laughs> they were not. I snoozed it a lot. Didn't realize they could hear it through the um, the walls. Walls were too thin. <laughs> they hear this in their nightmares now. Yeah. You just get this on loop like four times a morning. <laughs> <laughs> I think you would. I think you'd probably hate it after after not so much time. All right. Let's bang on a couple of these texts here. 508 says, Razor doing great job on ESPN and CAAs. We, I, I agree. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Working hard. Work you grinding. A lot of games. Absolutely working hard. I know yes. myself. Did it again today. Yes. I was going to say, still has energy level this morning. I, I'm not bad. Yeah, I've been taking care. I haven't been uh, partaking at night, so I've been trying to, like, I'm, I have energy in the morning. It's nice. Well, I got to tell you what Jaffe said about you in post game. Yeah, because please. It, because it to goes to this. this. He yeah. said, um, your hair and makeup look great. Oh, that's very nice. <laughs> yeah, that's very nice. Yeah, they got. You the, wondered how big a team you had to. Yeah, they they have much bigger teams there than they do. Uh, the Jaffe's got to do my hair at Nessa. <laughs> um, <laughs> they have other people down there. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Bu got to shout out Bu Terriers yep. in the Frozen Four already after big win over Minnesota on Saturday. We'll see today if BC joins them. They face Quinnipiac. I got another one about Razor here. Uh. Oh, where did it go? Uh, now I can't find it. Perfect. <laughs> oh, uh, yesterday afternoon they were saying Razor doesn't have his Canadian accent isn't enough. Oh, you need to be so, more Canadian. Yeah, that was for you. Yeah, yeah, it was Friday. Yeah, yeah I, I, I don't know how. I didn't hear the lead up into that. I so who knows how that's. But no, I, I don't have much. I've I've been told I have I don't have much of a Canadian accent anymore. There's I hear random it every once little in a words. While. Yeah, there's I do. there's, I hear it there's a few words, but I think I've been indoctrinated enough down here that there's uh, no a boot. I'm in the I'm in the middle. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I'm in the middle. Does it come out like if you get mad? Because you drunk. hear that from people. Like a lot of people, their accents come back when they when they get mad. But I, I feel like you never really get mad. No, I I, I try not to. I, I very rarely get mad. I not much bothers me. What about uh, when you have too many Molsons? Like kid, when I when I'm dr- <laughs> I, maybe when I'm drinking, it comes out a little <laughs> bit. I but it is funny because I hear my friends with Can- like I hear a Canadian accent much i'm very in tune to it now where i probably wasn't 20 years ago that's the big difference for me i hear it out of other people like I when i Sophia. go home i hear my yeah i so so has it a lot of words that she still allows her her accent to come through we also have uh from 603 how would one go about making razor lou and christian their best friends <laughs> <laughs> um I probably I, I I mean I can't speak for the other two guys. I mean desserts always a good bribery, starter. Yeah, was, bribery yeah. is is certainly the best. Yeah, That's how the world works. I'll, offer it? to bring some food over to the Nesson Studio. Yeah, for intermission. Absolutely. Yeah, I could use a butler. Six one seven says last year the Bruins wasted energy on the dumb record down the stretch. So I I still don't agree with this one because it's like, listen, they said they were going to go for the record because it was there to be had and they needed they just needed something to try to motivate themselves some sort of target to try to hit yeah guys have to play like you have to play games on the stretch you can't just be like oh we clinched the president's trophy we'll just take the next three weeks off and you know see a game one like you have to results aside you have to try to keep up good habits and, and, and play the right way and Obviously, it all crashed and burned for the Bruins in the playoffs, but I don't think they were wasting energy trying to get the record. Like, I think they were just 
trying to give themselves something to to chase. Yeah, they were still limiting guys' minutes during all that. Like you know, it's not it's not like they were mi- playing Bergeron and Pasternak and Marsh in twenty three minutes a night, so they could so they could get the record. Yeah, I I I still believe it was the right decision to lean into that record to lean they were trying to put pressure on themselves by trying to they saying they wanted the record that that's the whole mentality of that was we're going to put pressure on ourselves to try and go and get it to make it feel like we're just like we're trying to win the stanley cup we want to have these pressure situations uh unfortunately i don't think they replicated it quite enough i don't think they i think they thought that they could play a certain way by winning the record and do the same thing to win the Stanley Cup, and they they couldn't they couldn't change change pass and they couldn't chip pucks out and they couldn't just live to fight another day. And that's what I loved. I loved that on Tuesday night against Florida. I, they finally, for the first time in eight games that I really wanted them to do it, they flipped pucks out. They threw pucks off the boards after they screwed up in the first period trying to make plays. And two goals again ended up in the back of their net by make the defense trying to hit a reverse and trying to make a tough D to D play. After that, they rim pucks out. They threw pucks out of the zone. And that is the key against Florida. It's very obvious to me. If they play Florida and even Toronto for that matter, and they try and make too many plays in the defensive zone, they're going to get burnt and they have to just be simple in, in rimming pucks and icing pucks. I, they iced the puck three times in a row to start the second. I was ecstatic. <laughs> like, thank God. Like, they, And it wasn't because they tried to make a play and they missed. It was because they were getting the puck out of the zone. And, and I, I, that is the key to those teams. And I was really um, excited about their, their mentality changing a little bit on Tuesday. Yeah, let's go to uh, Joe in Ohio on the phone here. Uh, has some... Wants to say something about the Lindholm McAvoy pairing. What's up, Joe? Hi, guys. How you doing? And uh, happy Easter to all. Yep, happy yes, Easter to um, you as well. Thank you. This is kind of an extension to a call I made last week, and and I talked a lot about dumping pucks out, like Razor just said, and I agree with him a hundred percent. But on uh, Lindholm and McAvoy, I called last week and I said I wanted both of them to up their game. I mean, I love both guys, and I think they're studs, and the Bruins need them big time in the playoffs to get where they want to go. And for me, what's the better way for two guys to up their games both to, and th- to play together? I mean, you could split them up on occasion, but I think when those two guys play together offensively and defensively, I think they're both uh, more in tune and – they're your best defensemen, so you get them. They get the most ice time anyway. But putting them together, I think, creates more of an offensive flow too for the team, which they need some scoring from their defensemen. And um, as far as uh, uh, Pete goes, I'm not worried about him because I think his game translates really well to the playoffs, and I think he's going to be a, a big player for them. And he blocks a lot of shots. He plays physical and uh, stay at home a little bit. And that's more of what they need. So I like his play. He needs to stay in the lineup. So I just wanted to comment on that. You guys do a great job. And one more thing. Somebody in Boston, please get Rick Middleton in the Hall of Fame. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank, thank you, Joe. Thanks, Joe. I'm with you. Uh, yeah, so I, on, on Lindholm McAvoy, I think another, like, another aspect of this is when Lindholm's with Carlo, Montgomery uses that as a shutdown pairing. They get all the toughest assignments. They get all the big defensive zone draws. They they start way more shifts in the D zone than the offensive zone. And that can be that can be a pretty taxing job. Uh-huh. And th- they had a little bit of a tough stretch here before these last couple of games. Uh, I think it was over the span of four games. They had been on the ice for five goals against, 0-4. And it just felt like a really good time to split that up and kind of ease their workload and give them both a different look. If nothing else, just like mentally, like just give them some offensive chances, like get them Kyle out of being buried shots. in their own zone so often. Yeah. No, it's a, that's, that's a great point. That was my first thought is they're just trying to relieve some of that pressure. And, and that's a way of building in a little bit of rest for those guys. You know, we we don't need to see any more of Lindholm, Carlo. Can they shut down Matthews or Barkov or whoever they play in the first round? That 
we're we're going to see a lot of that. As much as we're going to see Linho McAvoy, hopefully, because we've all agreed that we kind of like that at times, we're also going to see a lot of Lindholm Carlo when they're up three to two in the third period coming over the boards. So that that we know that's what's going to happen. We don't need to see them play anymore, and I think it's a great way to to give them both a bit of a break where they're just doing half of those shifts, and you've still have got one of them on the ice over the next seven games, but the other one gets to take a little bit of a blow and get a little bit of offensive time, and Carlo gets four shots, and Lindholm gets a goal. That that's good to to build them up going into the end. I think it, that that's the smart. That's what I thought of when I saw the roster. I'm like, okay, you're giving these guys a break because they're just getting smoked with these defensive responsibilities. Yeah, uh, let's go to Jay in North Carolina here, um, who I think has uh, some other thoughts on the defense. Jay, what do you got? Yeah. Well, first of all, you, you people run a good program. I really enjoy listening Thank to you because you. you're always on point. Yeah, yeah, you, you you guys run a good program. But um, being down here in North Carolina, watch out for the Hurricanes. They are coming. Oh, uh, but yeah. I, thought that the, I thought squatting was illegal. And the Bruins seem to allow squatters in the front of the net, especially with the Florida Panthers. <laughs> That's got to end. And I think um, I, I, Razor, I think highly of Russian goalies. But uh, if the Bruins win the Stanley Cup, it'll be on the backs of Swayman and Elmark. I, I'm going to rearrange my mind on them. But uh, and and lastly, I will say that I I, I really appreciate Krejci and what Bergeron did. But it's Marshawn's team, and he's got the heart of a lion. And let's let's go Bruins. Let's let's take it all this time. All right, all right Jay. Th- thanks, Jay. Hey, yeah. let's let's hope first for that 400th goal. Yeah, we'll yeah. get to start with that. Yeah, squatting is legal in mass, isn't it? Or like is on it? some level, like it's hard to get rid of those guys. Anyways, <laughs> they know that. <laughs> <laughs> they have some protection. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, exactly. Too much. Um, yeah, I, so I did think, especially early in that Florida game, you did see some of the net front issues surface again. You know, the Panthers, right off opening shift, opening minute, you know, get in there and get an early goal. Um, their second goal, Bruins also kind of got a little scrambly around the net. Peak doesn't cut off the wraparound. So... Yes, there were definitely still things to work on there. And, you know, look, I, I've highlighted this a few times. Like, they do give up too many high danger chances. Of the 16 teams currently in the playoffs, they rank 15th in high danger chances allowed, uh, according to Natural Statrix. So it, it has to be cleaned up. You're, it's not – it's too late to turn it into a strength of the team, but it's got to be better than it's been most of the year. I think there's been signs – at times recently that there's improvement, even in that Florida game, I thought as the game went on, they got better at it. Like they weren't giving up those chances, but it was definitely there to to start that game. And we know it's the strength of Florida. So that is the kind of thing that, you know, probably just help decides a series. Like, can you keep them away from the net front? They're going to get some chances for sure but can you do a, a better job against them? Yeah, and the way to keep it, the, the, the reality is it's not the, the days of Darian Hatcher cross-checking guys in the face to clear the front of the net. Like, the, the way to clear the front of the net is not be in your zone. If, you're, if you get pucks out of your zone and you make play hard plays out of your zone, that that's that's really the secret. I think if you went through the top teams of that lead in those stats uh, of net front, et cetera, you would see that they move the puck out of the zone better than everyone else. It's not because they have – it's not because they're all Victor Hedman's in front of the net. No one has that. No one's built like that anymore. You can't do it. Yeah, you're not – You're, you're the, the just not in your zone very it. often, so then you don't have net front issues. So so that's the key for the Bruins. That's that's their secret to, to net front defense is not having to do it. That's, that's a good way to to avoid having those stats look bad. <laughs> that's right. Just don't do it, and it just you know don't take penalties. That the other thing, right? Like that yeah. that a lot of that comes off power plays exactly. and being in front and the chuck so. on the power play is just hanging out down there. Correct, and, and so you're going to give those up. You you just will because you can't get rid of those guys anymore. Yeah, and like one of those, you know, I mentioned Peak not cutting off the wrapper, and you he's out there with Lindholm. You wonder if that's two guys who just haven't played together mm-hmm. communication a little slow like you know who's supposed to be taking that who's it was a little bit and and also they they the guy ripped it was at least two it might have been the third point shot they ripped so by that point the chaos had started yeah. right if it's one point shot get it out 
everything's on. It's it's the second and third point shots where the chaos starts to happen because Reinhardt and Kachuk and Bard, they're all moving around. They're all on the tilt a whirl and and that was a Columbus play, right? Like that's that's a Columbus Blue Jackets goal through and through where he's just too aggressive. Instead, like leave that guy, right? Like the Bruins leave that guy and they they've built in the responsibility, they be, built in the patience to to not have to chase the guy that's down below the goal line. Just leave him there. But you know, when you you're playing a place that that's chaotic, then you do get chasing, and and I think we saw that a little bit. And he said it afterwards as much. He's like, "I've got to hold the post there. I'll get better at that. I I, I recognize that." By the way, Jay mentioned that the Hurricanes. How about the fit that Jake Gensel's oh, been man. there? Uh, Eleven games, only two goals, but fourteen assists. And with him on the ice at five on five. Hurricanes outscoring opponents eleven nothing. It's crazy, and I I listen. I've listened to a couple of games on the radio, like whatever, driving around at, and for whatever reason, his games are. It sounds like he's missed fifty eight open nets too. Like it's <laughs> like, and and again, I've only I've probably listened to like two games or two periods, but every time it's like Gensel missed an open night. Gensel missed, like it's crazy how good they are and and what kind of deal that has brought them. And Kuznetsov too is a perfect fit to go play with those guys. It, it just. Um, they're going to be, I'm glad the Bruins don't have to face them till the conference finals. Yep. Cause I think they're going to, they're going to do, if they get that goaltending sorted out, they can beat the Rangers again. All right. We got a break to catch here. Hour two of Sunday skate rolls on. You can join in 617-779-7937. Text us three, seven, nine, three, seven. Bridget, as you're trending. And then we'll be right back. Welcome back to Sunday skate. I'm Scott McLaughlin with Andrew Razor Raycroft. And Bridget Peru. We, we'll reset some thoughts on, on the Bruins here. Uh, specifically, want to pull back and take a look at the week as a whole. Because as we talked about on Monday, Montgomery calls out the team, has them bag skate at practice. He's dropping F-bombs. And the team responds on Tuesday down in Florida. And I'm curious... Razor, you mentioned that, you know, some of that might have been a little premeditated that Montgomery had a point he wanted to make after those New York and Philly games, a couple subpar efforts. And I'm I'm totally with him on that. Like I said that last week on Sunday Skate, that I having two games in a row like that at this time of year, I didn't like seeing. So they start they start practice a little slow. Five minutes in, he's he's on them. Whether it was actually that bad or not, you know almost besides the point. But, Razor, what, do, what does that kind of do for a team where, you know, you've had these two games, you have a day off Sunday, you show up Monday, and, like, that's the wake-up call. Like, that's that happens five minutes in. You're, you're a well, – you're a little annoyed because you're like, oh, like, really, Monday morning, <laughs> like, oh, I, we got to go on the road. Um but also it's happened before like the for the the guys that have been in the league a long time i'm sure once it started they recognized oh yeah this is you know this is kind of one of those pressure points that coaches have they only have one or two of these a year right like you have you have two maybe three if how you're many on do a, you think tortorella has uh 15 well no yeah <laughs> but they're diff- they're all you know, torts just his his level is much higher. Um, so you might get that skate 15 times, but the actual pressure point of like, you know, as a player, like, Oh boy, we're in one today is still two or three, even with torts. It's just his level of, Oh boy, we're in one is a little bit worse than skating up and down the ice twice. I, I That's, just feel like he's once a week. Like he's yeah, got no. like one a week. Like, yeah. Watch out. Yeah. 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 So, um, yeah, you're just like, ah, oh, all right, let's do it. it. And really what it is is I, I'm sure guys are sitting on the line, and I'm sure Marshawn, i sure McAvoy are saying, all right, fellas, head down. Let's do this. We got to do this. Like, that's what it is. Like, you'll get a guy or a couple of guys saying, hey, don't make this worse. Work. Put our heads down. It's not a big deal. Just get it done. Um, as a player, the worst thing you can do is make light of it or not accept it that's when the coach really goes over the edge. As long as you put your head down and you work through it, uh, everybody stays happy. And, and again, you know you know what's coming after the skate. You know it's the three-on-three three down low. So don't mess around. Don't take penalties. Don't trip guys. 
and work really hard and battle with each other and make it look like we're battling really hard to make everybody happy. That's that's how it works. It's a bit of a it's a showman thing. It really is. Like what? It, how does a goalie respond to this kind of stuff? Oh, no bad goals. No bad goals. You're gonna battle. You're gonna grind. You're gonna cover rebounds. You're not gonna get mad. You're going to know that someone's going to poke for a rebound. You know that someone's going to fall on you. You know that there's going to be a battle in front. And as a goal, you don't come like in a normal practice, you would be like, dude, what are you doing? You'd be annoyed. But in that situation, you, you let everything go. Don't be seen. Don't be seen. That That's the key. Don't be seen. Yeah. And then there's also there's the media game you have to play, too. Correct. Because, of course, we talked to Marshan and Coyle yeah. after practice. And the first question is, what did you think of Montgomery doing that? And. Yeah. As team leaders, you got to say, like, well, we had it coming, yep. you know, which is exactly what they said. You know, the Martians, like, we're professionals. We have to show up every day. Energy wasn't there. And, you know, even, even if they disagree, like, even if they think, like, hey, I thought we actually were getting off to a pretty good start. <laughs> yeah. Like, you get, you know, I, that's where that relationship between Montgomery and the players comes in because we know – He's a good communicator. We know he has good relationships with all these players on a team-wide level and an individual level. He's, you know, he has a lot of one-on-one meetings with players, not just when they're doing something bad, but just to check in throughout the season. Uh-huh. And that's where, like, you know, Marshan, Coyle, McAvoy, Pasenak, if they're not on the same page as the coach, like, then that doesn't work. But if they, if they're buying in and saying and like you said, like they're gonna lead those wind sprints, yeah, and, and be like, all right, guys, like we we got to do this. That's when it can work, and I think you certainly saw them respond on Tuesday, even though they got off to a slow start in that game. They, clearly, they gave up a goal in the first minute. Yeah, like they clearly brought the compete level intensity most of that game. Do you think it it carried through the rest of the week? Because again, Wednesday in Tampa, second night of a back to back. I know, you know, Marchand, again, says the right thing, says, hey, you got to be able to play back-to-backs at this level where the best trained athletes in the world. But I think everyone knows, like, you're not you're not going to have the same energy there. So, And not only that, but especially when, I mean, you're fighting. You're, the game with Florida was emotionally draining. Emotionally and physically. Yeah, yeah. well, d- definitely physically. I mean, Lindholm technically had his first fight of his career, which I didn't think was much of a fight. It was more it's more of a roughing. <laughs> um, Marshawn had a fight, but, I mean, guys were getting – guys, it was it was a game that beat you up, and, and you know, it, it, it's an emotional stress too. I thought they carried it all week just because of their defensiveness. I, I think that's the, that's the focus. Um, you give up two against Tampa. You give up two against Washington. You kill the penalty in overtime. So you have all of that grind. You have the grind in Tampa that – you know, of just giving up the two. I know Tampa didn't have their best either, but you didn't take any penalties against Tampa Bay. You stayed out of the box all week. You only had two power penalties, uh, and then the four minute in in the in the overtime against Washington. So, no, I thought I thought the grind was there all week. Um, it's going to look different every game still, and 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 but I think again the effort, the focus, the attention to details not giving up the odd man rushes that they were he was really upset about uh against Philly like he made it very known that that was unacceptable in the third period to give up all, those odd man rushes that that's what kills him more you hear him talk about everything and and he's pretty measured but if they start giving up odd man rushes it drives him crazy it really does and he knows that this is a that's the bugaboo of this team if they start if they give up two on ones they are donezo because that means their offense isn't working that means they're taking too many chances their d's not in their focus the the forwards aren't focused so it, odd man rushes are a big thing with this team florida can get away with giving them up toronto gets away with giving them up but this team can't and and you hear that when they do. So I think that week, this week, they didn't do that. Um, so so I think it carried all week. Yeah, and it, that, it really ties into the identity of what they want to be. Yes. Like, they, they want, they feel like they have to be this tight-checking team. Mm-hmm. And they're probably right because they, they don't have as much pure skill as last year. Marshand has said this multiple times this year, and including this week, which is, you know, that's the kind of team that they're going to have to be. When they try to be something else, when they try to make too many high-skill plays or whatever, 
that's when they get in trouble. And that's what leads to a lot of those odd man rushes is getting careless with the puck in the offensive zone, attempting a play that's not there. Um, we got, let's go to Tom in Boston here, uh, who has some thoughts on NHL officiating. Good morning, Tom. Um, well, generally it's always bad, but specifically, <laughs> um, I, I was wondering why, like, why don't they have the, if you get injured, you have to be out for at least a couple minutes thing. Cause like TJ Oshie takes the four and then is, is fine. Like if I'm an NHL player, why don't I like, like Randy, the Ram Robinson, like keep a, a razor blade in my, 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 my skate or something. And, and like mark myself up, like that seems incredibly arbitrary. And then real quick, if you'll allow me, uh, Bridget, PWHL Boston, are they going to make the playoffs? It seems like a huge disaster if they don't. Uh, thanks very much, everybody. Well, thank you, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Well, as of right now, they're right on the bubble. And I'm I'm having a hard time figuring out exactly why a team that has as much talent as they do, the three, like, the three signees they had before the draft, uh, they're all some of the best. Like, they potentially have the best forward, best defenseman, and best goalie in the league, but they just can't seem to put it together. It's been a frustrating year for them for sure. So it doesn't make a whole lot of sense uh, why they're – well, they just can't – they're all close games, but they, they're not able to win some of them. Or the, and, and it's not like the NHL, and I know, Scott, you talk about this as well. It's a three-point system. It's not a two-point system. So, like, you you get fewer points for winning in overtime, and that's happened to them a few times where they just needed the regulation win. They needed those extra points. You get penalized for not winning in regulation in the PWHL. Also, it might help them to get a home game once in a while. Yeah. I, feel like, yeah. I feel like they haven't been in Lowell in, like, a month. They, I know I haven't been at the rink in a yeah. while <laughs> and I'm not back there until their next home game is April 18th. Yeah. Like that. That's kind of crazy. Yeah. Um, all right. So NHL officiating. So yeah, I, I, I didn't see blood on Oshi. Like it, I saw like a drip like a very on his little nose, bit. but I, it didn't continue like razor when usually when you get punched in the nose, you're even as like not even I've I've had this happen to me not even You've been sports punched in the nose? or no like hit in the nose yeah, yeah. with a ball or something, um, it just keeps bleeding and you can't get it to stop usually. Yeah. And this would just happen to be like one drop and it was over. Yeah, he bit his lip for <laughs> sure. Um, <laughs> like the caller was saying with the razor blade, guys would try and bite their lip or you know playoff time especially you're you're doing anything to find some blood. Um, I I thought it was a thing that you you had to come off if you you're cut if they call if but, they blow the whistle because you're injured you have to come off but if it's because of a penalty you don't got it now so the opposite side of that right is you should you know if, if david pasternak gets cut you want him out there right away on the four minute like that that's and and you would actually be penalizing the team that that got is the victim yeah so i understand that too i guess yeah and- i think his point more was that it What's the line of of like the? What, the why blo- is one little blood and what? Yeah, no, it, that's it is completely kind of arbitrary, but there's really no other way to do it because uh, otherwise we're really going down the rabbit hole. Oh, this guy got you know that high stick was harder than that high stick, and this high stick, and that's high, like it's it, the, the the easiest and most obvious right. way is blood because it can yeah because it can also be for for an injury even if there's not blood, but then that's like. Well, what qualifies well, who's as an injured? injury? Yeah, like, yeah, who's injured? Everyone's right, like, injured. Like, do you have to not come back? Like, do you have to yeah, go down right. the tunnel? Yeah. yeah, guys are. I mean, it, it's it's an the guys get so mad when they get high stuck and they aren't cut right, like because it actually hurts. Like high sticks do hurt, like wherever you get hit, and then to not have blood, you're like that's such a, a waste, waste. <laughs> such a waste. Uh, yeah. So, but you know, hey, as we've said, like great job by the Bruins penalty kill to to kill that off um you know it, it it's funny we we earlier touched on since we're on the topic of officiating like in the playoffs you know that there's the cliche is like there's fewer penalties called and there do tend to be fewer power plays but statistically there's actually more penalties called it's just a lot of them end up being like the matching stuff that they're because everyone's doing stuff after the whistle so yeah. You know, and guys like are playing more aggressive, so you get more, more of kind of like the the harder fouls, like you know, an elbow or a cross check, and maybe they let more of the stick work go. Mm-hmm. So it becomes a more phys- like the actual number of penalties still kind of come out in the wash in the end, but it's just more physical. Like so, they're calling more physical fouls and letting some of those t- ticky tack stick fouls go. 
Yeah, yeah and, and they also allow the killers to kill harder. Yeah. You, you don't get five on threes. You, you don't get that ticky-tack hook that you get in October at the top of the circle on a f- on a power play, right? That yeah. that those go away as well. So Maybe, let you clean out the front of the net a correct. little more. Correct. You can actually give a guy a whack on the half wall. You're not, you know, you can get your stick up. So um it it, it does it does it, it doesn't feel the same. And and it, and again, that's why the power play's got to get going because it's harder to score on the power play and and it but more important, just so much makes such a difference when you get that what well, you need to basically two power plays goals every three games is that essentially when you you know get you put you up two one in a series over three games those two power play goals so um that that's that's where they need to get at unless it's the 2011 bruins in which case you never yeah. have to score on the power play <laughs> that's right then 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 you put you know zidane ochara we'll go back to zidane ochara yeah. and that that you don't need to score any time at all if he was out on the ice cross-checking people in the head <laughs> yeah uh, so Razor, I know we only have you until this next break because you have more NCAA I'm hockey. I'm cooking the Connecticut again. Yeah, yes. to get down to. And we had another text uh, about NCAAs. Ask Razor who will win the NCAA tournament. No, oh, it's Boston College. I don't know how they lose watching yeah. them take over the game. They they, they kind of had their two bad periods already. I think of the tournament and and pulled away and still won six to one. Um, they're. Their special teams are too good, and their goalie's too good to lose one-and-done games. That's the way I see it. Unless unless the Terriers pull up the blueprint um, of, of win, getting ahead 2 nothing, 3 nothing in that championship game. I just don't, I don't see how Michigan State or Michigan can beat them. I don't see how Quinnipiac can beat them. So you're looking at the, the finals of... Yeah, Denver. Denver, no, I don't think... Yeah, no, I mean, not you can't really compare games, but I mean... That UMass team had no chance against BC, and they almost oh, beat no. Denver. So no, I mean um, we watched it in. in so it know. feels like it. I mean, it'd be unbelievable for college hockey here in Boston to get those two teams to the finals. Uh, they look the best right now. Of course, anything can happen in the Frozen Four, but it's too, it's too bad. It, and I have to be careful on my, here I, this year because I get like hate mail from people in Minnesota and <laughs> Michigan and Denver that I'm such an East Coast homer and I don't know anybody and it, like this whole thing. Well, it, the two best teams are in Boston. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we watched them. Like, I broadcast a few of their games. Like, watching BC play, they will just make you pay. You can't take a penalty against them. No. They will make you pay. And I, they have been one of the most entertaining college hockey teams I've watched. It's very clear that these guys are destined for the pros sooner rather than later. And it's fun to watch them play. I, I don't know. I, I'm hoping for a good game. Like I said, I'm going to be there. Um, I, I hope it's close, but I feel like it's only going to be close for, like, the first half, and then all of a sudden BC's going to blow it open, and uh, it's going to be a big I mean, Qu- Quinnipiac's they've been a giant slayer in the past. Yes, like, they did it all last they've year done against it. Well, Michigan. They're the defending national champs. Yes, yep. they are, and I am going with a bunch of Quinnipiac no, fans. So there, there's You could say today's the best chance for BC to lose. The, like, you could say that – Quinnipiac lines up better than BU does at this point in in how they can scheme something up and stay in the game. I, I you know, I wish yeah, you know, it today I think today is that that matchup that that the Eagles have been most nervous about for the last two months is getting this game today. One thing to to tie this back to Bruins, if Quinnipiac loses Colin Graff and Jacob Quillen watch begins. Oh. Two of the top NCAA free agents. Uh, Quillen a center. Graff can play center or wing. Um, widely considered two of, if not the top two, uh, college free agents this year. Um, Quillen was, he was a Bruins development camp uh, invitation. So they've, you know, they're familiar with him. I believe he'd probably be the one they're more likely to be in on, um, but that if Quinnipiac loses to BC today, that basically starts Sunday night, Monday. Like that, that could happen pretty fast. So. Yeah, and the, the further we get in, and obviously the tournament's almost over, uh, hockey season's almost over. But you see each of the as each team gets knocked out, the young guys are coming into the league, and you're like, okay, who's cracking the lineup? Like, wh- who are we watching? Like. In in a few weeks, Cutter Gauthier is probably playing for for Anaheim. Like yeah, I looked up. He's only got one game. He can only he's only got one game. And I almost only got one game that last week. Really? Yeah, because wow, we were looking have, that up. So because well, they're going to be well, not even. Play. He's playing until the thirteenth. Um, Unless they lose today. 
unless they lose today. <laughs> I don't see it I happening. Don't see but that happening. Well, it should be fun down there. If you haven't, you know, got anything to do this afternoon, it is fun. Yeah. Right. Well, it's, that's it's what I'm take. doing. There you go. That's <laughs> yeah. It. And, and the second game today, Michigan, Michigan State. So not not a local game, but no, one of the biggest rivalries in college hockey. So. And they've gone to overtime last week. Uh-huh. It'll be it'll be a very worthwhile six o'clock, six thirty. Yeah, six thirty yeah, game tonight. Six thirty game. So watch. All right. I'll yeah, be there. watch because you'll see Razor. That's exactly. it. Thanks. Yeah. Very quickly tonight. Hopefully, just quickly. No Razor overtime. in the studio. No overtime tonight. <laughs> no overtime tonight. Get me home quick. That's what I'm hoping for. All right. So Thanks, we got guys. we got Happy one more Easter. segment of Sunday Skate. Razor is off to Bristol, Connecticut. We'll be back right after this to wrap things up. Welcome back to Sunday Skate. Final segment with Bridget Prue. I'm Scott McLaughlin. Razor had to take off. He's heading down to Bristol, Connecticut for more college hockey. Bridget. One topic we haven't really touched on yet that I think is worth hitting on here maybe to wrap up is uh, what's going on in the Bruins' bottom six and news this week that Pat Maroon uh, skated three days in a row. He was not on the road trip. Now, the Bruins actually came home after the Washington game. They'll practice in Brighton on Monday, and then they head back out on the road for Nashville and Carolina so we'll see if he maybe joins them for those two games, but he's at least been on the ice. And I think it's an interesting discussion because we all we all figure he is, once he's ready to play, he's playing. They're at least going to want to see what he, he looks like. So who comes out, who's earned the right to stay in? And I look at the three, I call them three JBs on the fourth line. <laughs> Johnny Beecher, Jesper Bogvist, and Justin Brazo, I think have all earned the right to stay in. And I look at James Van Riemsdyk as someone who, you know, whether it's because of the illness or his play or whatever, you know, I, I think that illness has probably lingered a bit. Right now he's kind of out of the lineup. I mean, he's been out more than he's been in recently. Yeah, well, have you ever had an illness where you just you can't get right? Like you lose weight and you you just don't feel like yourself for weeks. I feel like he's dealing with that. I heard Jack reference on the broadcast maybe trying to put weight back on. I think he has lost weight during the illness and so I do think that it has somewhat to do with that. Uh so if he's not 100% healthy then then just try to get him healthy, I guess. Um and in terms of who comes out Lauko feels like the option that you're more likely to go with just because Beecher has been playing well. He scored again yesterday. Um, Boquis is playing his role well. Both of those guys can can win face-offs for you, take face-offs. Um, Brazo is, seems to be locked in at this point. Um, you're not only relying on him. you know He's playing on the third line right now, actually. Um, so he seems to have worked his way up the depth chart, which leaves you to to really look at Lauko as someone that could be the guy coming out. Yeah, I'd say it's it's Lauko and and right now probably Van Riemsdyk because Bogvis has been very good in that fourth line center role for months now and they really like his speed, his playmaking, his ability with the puck on his stick going through the middle of the ice. Brazo, as you mentioned, absolutely looks like he belongs the way he gets chances around the net front. Beecher, his Defense, his faceoff ability, penalty killing. He had, he, he wasn't used in in the overtime penalty kill, but all during that game yesterday, he continues to get top penalty kill time. Um, you know, I think has been playing better on the wing as he's gotten more time there because they're still doing they're still doing the switch off where he's going to take all the faceoffs, then go to the wing and Bogvis plays center once play starts, but. Yeah, Maroon's another potential option on the third line. Like, they could try him there as well. So, I've said before that, you know, in a perfect world, I think the Bruins' best third line has James Van Reems, like, on it. Even with this prolonged slump that he's had, going back even before the illness, he's fifth on the team in five-on-five points per 60 minutes. But he hasn't been at that level for a while now. So, you're kind of running out of time to try to get them there and and you know if someone like Brazo or Maroon can can fit on the third line like yeah give them that chance well and and my thought is so say Maroon comes in that takes Lauko out of the lineup 
Would you rather see Van Riemsdyk than Beecher? Right now, I would have to say Beecher. I, he's playing better recently, and, and obviously he scores on Saturday. Great individual play. He forces a turnover in the D zone and takes off the other way on a breakaway and finishes with a nice five-hole backhand. I just think he's playing better. I think he's contributing in more ways right now than Van Riemsdyk has. Now, if Van Riemsdyk can get right by the end of the regular season, you know, whether it is putting weight back on, just getting his game back, whatever it might be, then that changes the conversation. But I'm kind of at a point right now where I I have to see that first. Yeah, there's only seven games left. Yeah, It's a really tough time in the year to be kind of finding yourself dealing with something – health-wise, that's keeping you on the outside because then it's like, okay, they're they're solidifying a lineup that doesn't include you um, with if you're still struggling with, with this stuff. And I think that James Van Riems, like adds to the power play, but Beecher adds to the penalty kill. And James Van Riems, like, can can do that net front stuff when he when he's playing at his best, but Beecher can win face-offs. It's like, it's, they're completely different players and it, it depends where you want to line them up and it depends what you value most in the playoffs. Yeah, and I mean, it's easy to say this, but they haven't done it. Like, I feel like they should be able to find someone else for the power play. It might even be Brazo. Like, he's been going to the second unit. Why I, not try him on the top unit? I think that they should. I think yeah. they honestly have probably waited too long to try it. All right, well, we're getting our uh, playoff music here. This was Nico's choice. Oh, okay. This was Nico explain. Um, yeah, Bridget didn't have a song, so she said, what do you want to use? I said, I don't know. This is what I used to use in college to play off my radio show. So <laughs> okay. this is this – is, we're letting Nico take control now. I had no ideas today. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. I, You know, when I was, like, in middle school and high school, I liked the Red Hot Chili Peppers. They're one of those bands that – like, I don't dislike them now, but I just feel like I grew out of as I got older. Like, I, I can't remember the last time I actually listened to Red Hot I Chili Peppers. I feel like I like today. them more it's, it's today. as I get older. Huh. I feel like they've gotten like better with age for me. But the people after me didn't like this because it's a five-minute song, and we didn't have commercials at our station. It was just songs. I used uh. to go up to the break, so like the first five minutes of their show, they're listening to this. <laughs> That's a good, well played, Nico. <laughs> All right. So we got Christian Arcan next? Yes. All right. Stick around for Arcan. We'll be back next Sunday, 9 a.m. Hey, guys. Thanks for watching the Skate Podcast. If you want to see more of our videos, visit our playlist. Not in front of a screen? You can listen to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to follow us on social media. And if you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to give us a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel, and leave a comment.